Karawane. You probably asked yourself, what the heck was that? And you're right, because that's what Dada and the Dadaist movement was all about. This is our conversation for AP Art History, and I'm Mr. Bruns, and our topic for today is Dada. To understand Dadaism and where it's coming from, you have to have that historical context. And the context behind Dadaism is World War I, which began in 1914 and ended in 1918. And it is born of this sort of naive attitude about war and how this war was going to be fought. Nobody understood that this was going to be a four-year war, that there were going to be two fronts, um, the Eastern Front and the Western Front, and particularly with the Western Front, the brutality behind this war, trench warfare, machine guns, barbed wire, um, flamethrowers, tanks, the use of airplanes, and just the simple uh, mass amount of death that occurred. Because in 1914, many people on both sides believed that this war was going to be done by Christmas time and we would be home. But in the end, in 1916 alone, Germany would lose 850,000 soldiers, France would lose 700,000 soldiers, and Great Britain uh, lost 400,000 soldiers and so this was horrific and this was new and after the war this kind of gave um, birth to that lost generation of writers like Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald okay and it gave the birth of the book like All Quiet on the Western Front so Dadaism is born of World War One now the first thing you need to understand is that Dadaism is one of many artistic movements that really uh, addressed the issue of the slaughter and the moral questions it posed. Um, Dadaism was a transitional movement and it had a very distinct local manifestation uh, that arose almost simultaneously in places like Berlin and New York or Paris or in Zurich. Um, Dada question the concept of art itself. Okay, Dadaism mocked the senselessness of rational thought. It was the rational th thought that got us into World War I. And so Dadaism is mocking the senselessness of this, of this thinking process, uh, the foundations of modern society, rational thought. And what Dadaism did is that, that it hugged the idea of mocking iconoclasm even in its name, which has no real or fixed meaning. Dada is in Germany, baby talk. In France, it means hobby horse. In uh, Romania or in Russia, it means yes, yes. In the African dialect, it means the tail of a sacred cow. So there's no real meaning behind this. It's it's mocking iconoclasm. It's, it's not destroying art, but it's mocking it. And the goal of Dada artists was to annihilate the conventional understanding of art as something to be look, you know, to be precious, to be, uh, you know, kept in awe. And what Dada did is it replaced it with strange and irrational art objects, and really begins to ask you, the viewer, and the art community, this one very important question: What is art? So let's begin with Marcel Duchamp, and he created some of the most challenging works, some of the most complex works in Dadaism. Now to give you some background to Duchamp, he uh, was inspired by Cubism. He experimented with it. He also did a painting called The Nude Descending the Staircase Number 2, uh, one of the most controversial works to be included in the Armory Show. Um, he claimed that painting became 
a mindless activity for him. And so he, he fell into the idea of Dadaism, and he devised the Dada genre that would be coined ready-made. So Duchamp uh, went to America. He was welcomed in the American art world. And at the first annual Forum exhibition held in 1917, the show was advertised as an, as an unjuried event, and any work of art could be submitted for the low, low cost of $6.00 and it would be displayed. And so Duchamp would spend two years devising a work of art that had one goal in mind, and that was to be offensive and to be shocking. So shocking and offensive that it would ultimately be rejected. And so he submits this anonymous uh, work, and it's simply just a common porcelain urinal that he just went down to the local plumber and purchased from, which he turned on to one side, that it would no longer function as uh, a urinal, and then he signed it R. Mutt, which is a play on the name of the urinal's manufacturer, which is the J.L. Mott Ironworks. And he got his wish. It was rejected. This is one of the most controversial works in the 20th century art world. It, it is, uh, it, it incites laughter, uh, anger, it is embarrassing to some people, it's disgusting, uh, it is transgressive by openly referring to something that you do in private that is in the bathroom and it, you know and it kind of opens us up to this sort of being vulnerable because nothing's more embarrassing than somebody walking in when you're doing your business so Duchamp questions the very essence of what constitutes a work of art and ever since the Whistler's famous court trial, the art on trial in 1877, avant-garde artists agreed that a work needed need be neither descriptive nor well crafted. And here Duchamp does this piece and the art was primarily conceptual. I mean he spent two years trying to put it together. And on one level Duchamp's updated the practice into modern terms by arguing that art objects might not it might not only be crafted in part by others but that the objects of art could actually be something that is mass produced so when the fountain was rejected Duchamp anticipated that it would be uh, the artist resigned from his his group the Society of Independent Arts and he published an unsigned uh, editorial in the Dada journalist in which he described as the scandal of R. Mutt. So he's reacting to this. And the only works of art America uh, has given are her plumbing and bridges. And he added on whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. He chose it, meaning that he chose this to be his work of art. So Duchamp leaves America, returns to Paris, and he's going to challenge the French art world with the work that he entitled the El Achaud Okay, And he describes this as modified ready-made. Uh, and he does this because in 1911 uh, an employee of the museum, the Louvre Museum, had stolen the Leonardo's most famous painting, the Mona Lisa and believing it should have been returned to Italy. Well, it took two years for people to, to hunt it down and recover it. And while missing, the Mona Lisa became even more famous and was horribly reproduced on posters and in postcards. So Duchamp chose to comment on the nature of the fame of this piece and on the degrading image of the Mona Lisa. And so what he did is he purchased this really cheap postcard uh, reproduction and drew a mustache and a beard on our very famous Mona Lisa and he turned what we would considered an important artifact culturally or sacred cultural artifact into an object that would that was crudely ridiculing the image and the letters that he would scrawl across the bottoms the El Ashad Okul uh, really politely translated means she's hot for it and so now he adds not just the mustache and, and, and the beard, but this sort of crude sexual innuendo to this already cheapened image. So like his prior work, The Fountain, this work challenges preconceived notions about what constitutes art. 
See, as one of the Dada founders said, Dada was born of disgust. So let's leave the world of Duchamp and let's go to uh, Germany, to Berlin, where Dada's pursued a bit of a different agenda and a different form. You have to understand that Dadaism took different forms in major centers. And one of the most distinctive features of what we call Berlin Dada was its agitprop agenda. If we compare this to the other Dadas, Berlin Dada also was producing usually large amounts of what we call visual art, especially in collage and photo montage. Um, our example here is of Hannah Hock. I guess that's my worst German ever, and she produced even more um, pointed political photo montages. So we could say that this is art and politics if we were choosing our themes. And uh, Berlin largest publishing house design decorative patterns and writing articles on crafts for women's magazines and Hawk considered herself part of the women's movement in the 1920s and she really disapproved of contemporary mass media representations of women and um, had a fight for her place in the role of Berlin Dada and so she kind of sees herself as a bit of a suffragette so she comes up with this cut with the Dada kitchen knife through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epic in Germany. One heck of a title. And she combines images and words from the popular press, the political posters, and the photographs to create a complex and an angry critique of the Weimar Republic. Here we see women physically cutting apart the beer uh, bloated bellies of the German establishment in this photo montage. And includes portraits of androgynous Dada characters uh, such as herself and several other Dada artists. She also places in the image Marx and Lenin. And is this a commentary on what she really thought of her fellow Dada as not only just of not just the government but the people that were within her uh, artistic group as well.